Chapter 5, The Parable of the Good Samaritan. The Nature of True Religion Illustrated In the story of the Good Samaritan, Christ illustrates the nature of true religion. He shows that it consists not in systems, creeds, or rites, but in the performance of loving deeds, in bringing the greatest good to others, in genuine goodness. The lesson is no less needed in the world today than when it fell from the lips of Jesus. Selfishness and cold formality have well nigh extinguished the fire of love and dispelled the graces that should make fragrant the character. Many who profess his name have lost sight of the fact that Christians are to represent Christ. Unless there is practical self-sacrifice for the good of others, in the family circle, in the neighborhood, in the church, and wherever we may be, then, whatever our profession, we are not Christians. Desire of Ages, page 497 and 504. Who is my neighbor? Among the Jews, the question, Who is my neighbor? caused endless dispute. They had no doubt as to the heathen and the Samaritans. These were strangers and enemies. But where should the distinction be made among the people of their own nation and among the different classes of society? Whom should the priest, the rabbi, the elder regard as neighbor? They spent their lives in the round of ceremonies to make themselves pure. Contact with the ignorant and careless multitude they taught would cause defilement that would require wearisome effort to remove. Were there to regard the unclean as neighbors? This question Christ answered in the parable of the Good Samaritan. He showed that our neighbor does not mean merely one of the church or faith to which we belong. It has no reference to race, color, or class distinction. Our neighbor is every person who needs our help. Our neighbor is every soul who is wounded and bruised by the adversary. Our neighbor is everyone who is the property of God. Christ's Object Lessons, page 376 illustrated by the parable. Christ was speaking to a large company. The Pharisees, hoping to catch something from his lips that they could use to condemn him, sent a lawyer to him with a question. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Christ read the hearts of the Pharisees as an open book, and his answer to the questioner was, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. Thou hast answered right, Christ said, this do, and thou shalt live. The lawyer knew that by his own answer he had condemned himself. He knew that he did not love his neighbor as himself. But willingly to justify himself, he asked, And who is my neighbor? Christ answered this question by relating an incident, the memory of which was fresh in the minds of his hearers. Manuscript 117, 1903. A certain man, he said, went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. In journeying from Jerusalem to Jericho, the traveler had to pass through a portion of the wilderness of Judea, the road led down a wild, rocky ravine which was infested with robbers and was often the scene of violence. It was here that the traveler was attacked, stripped of all that was valuable, and left half dead by the wayside. As he lay thus, a priest came that way. He saw the man lying wounded and bruised, weltering in his own blood, but he left him without rendering any assistance. He passed by on the other side. Then a Levite appeared, Curious to know what had happened, he stopped and looked at the sufferer. He was convinced of what he ought to do, but it was not agreeable duty. He wished that he had not come that way, so that he would not have seen the wounded man. He persuaded himself that the case was no concern of his, and he too passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, traveling the same road, saw the sufferer, and he did the work that the others had refused to do. With gentleness and kindness he ministered to the wounded man. When he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. 
And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave him to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. The priest and the Levite both professed piety, but the Samaritan showed that he was truly converted. It was no more agreeable for him to do the work than for the priest and the Levite, but in the spirit and works he proved himself to be in harmony with God. In giving this lesson, Christ presented the principles of the law in a direct, forcible way, showing his hearers that they had neglected to carry out these principles. His words were so definite and pointed that the listeners could find no opportunity to cavil. The lawyer found in the lesson nothing that he could criticize. His prejudice in regard to Christ was removed, but he had not overcome his national dislike sufficiently to give credit to the Samaritan by name. When Christ asked, Which now of these three thinkest thou was the neighbor unto whom that fell among the thieves? He answered, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go, and do thou likewise. Show the same tender kindness to those in need. Thus you will give evidence that you keep the whole law. Christ's Object Lessons, pages 379 and 380. Anyone in need is our neighbor. Any human being who needs our sympathy and our kind offices is our neighbor. The suffering and destitute of all classes are our neighbors, and when their wants are brought to our knowledge, it is our duty to relieve them as far as possible. Testimonies, Volume 4, pages 226 and 227. By this parable, the duty of man to his fellow man is forever settled. We are to care for every case of suffering and to look upon ourselves as God's agents to relieve the needy to the very uttermost of our ability. We are to be laborers together with God. There are some who manifest great affection for their relatives, for their friends and favorites, who yet fail to be kind and considerate to those who need sympathy and who need kindness and love. With earnest hearts, let us inquire, who is my neighbor? Of neighbors, our neighbors are not merely our associates and special friends. They're not simply those who belong to our church or who think as we do. Our neighbors are the whole human family. We are to do good to all men, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. We are to give to the world an exhibition of what it means to carry out the law of God. We are to love God supremely and our neighbor as ourselves. Review and Herald, January 1, 1895. True Religion Misrepresented The priest and the Levite had been for worship to the temple whose service was appointed by God himself. To participate in that service was a great and exalted privilege, and the priest and Levite felt that having been thus honored, it was beneath them to minister to an unknown sufferer by the wayside. Thus they neglected the special opportunity which God had offered them as his agents to bless a fellow being. Many today are making a similar mistake. They separate their duties into two distinct classes, the one class is made up of great things to be regulated by the law of God. The other class is made up of so-called little things in which the command, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, is ignored. This fear of work is left to caprice, subject to inclination or impulse. Thus the character is marred in the religion of Christ misrepresented. There are those who th would think it lowering to their dignity to minister to suffering humanity. Many look with indifference and contempt upon those who have laid the temple of the soul in ruins. Others neglect the poor from a different motive. They are working, as they believe, in the cause of Christ, seeking to build up some worthy enterprise. They feel that they are doing a great work, and they cannot stop to notice the wants of the needs and distressed. In advancing their supposedly great work, they may even oppress the poor. They may place them in hard and trying circumstances deprive them of their rights or neglect their needs. Yet they feel that all this is justifiable because they are, as they think, advancing the cause of Christ. Christ Object Lessons, page 382 and 383. Far-reaching requirements of God's law. 
To leave the suffering neighbor unrelieved is a breach of the law of God. God brought the priest along that way in order that with his own eyes he might see a case that needed mercy and help. But the priest, though holding a holy office, whose work it was to bestow mercy and to do good, passed on by the other side. His character was exhibited in its true nature before the angels of God. For a pretense, he could make long prayers, but he could not keep the principles of the law in loving God with all his heart and his neighbor as himself. The Levite was of the same tribe as was the wounded, bruised sufferer. All heaven watched as the Levite passed down the road to see if his heart would be touched with human woe. As he beheld the man, he was convicted of what he ought to do. But as it was not an agreeable duty, he wished he had not come that way, so that he need not have seen the man who was wounded and bruised, naked and perishing, and in want of help from his fellow men. He passed on his way, persuading himself that it was none of his business, and that he had no need to trouble himself over the case claiming to be an expositor of the law, to be a minister in sacred things, he yet passed on by the other side. Enshrined in the pillar of cloud, the Lord Jesus had given special direction in regard to the performance of acts of mercy toward men and beast. While the law of God requires supreme love to God and impartial love to our neighbors, its far-reaching requirements also take in the, num the dumb creatures that cannot express in words their wants or sufferings. Thou shalt not see thy brother's ass or any his ox fall down by the way and hide thyself from them. Thou shalt surely help him to lift them up again. He who loves God not only will love his fellow men, but will regard with tender compassion the creatures which God has made. When the Spirit of God is in man, it leads him to relieve rather than to create suffering. Review and Herald, January 1, 1895. The principles of God's law were forgotten. The priest and Levite had no excuse for their cold-hearted difference. The law of mercy and kindness was plainly stated in the Old Testament scriptures. It was their appointed work to minister to just such cases as the one whom they had coldly passed by. Had they obeyed the law they claimed to respect, they would not have passed this man by without helping him. But they had forgotten the principles of the law that Christ enshrouded in the pillar of cloud, had given to their fathers as he had led them through the wilderness. Who is my neighbor? This is a question that all our churches need to understand. Had the priest and the Levite read understandingly the Hebrew code, their treatment of the wounded man would have been far different. Manuscript 117, 1903 Conditions of Inheriting Eternal Life The conditions of inheriting eternal life are plainly stated by our Savior in the most simple manner. The man who was wounded and robbed represents those who are subjects of our interest, sympathy, and charity. If we neglect the cases of the needy and the unfortunate that are brought under our notice, no matter who they may be, we have no assurance of eternal life, for we do not answer the claims that God has upon us. We are not compassionate and pitiful to humanity, because they may not be kith or kin to us. You have been found transgressors of the second great commandment, upon which the last six commandments depend. Whosoever offendeth in one point is guilty of all. Those who do not open their hearts to the wants and sufferings of humanity will not open their hearts to the claims of God as stated in the first four precepts of the Decalogue. Idols claim the hearts and affections, and God is not honored and does not reign supreme. Testimony, Volume 3, page 524. Your Opportunity and Mine Today God gives men opportunity to show whether they love their fellow and their neighbor. He who truly loves God and his fellow man is he who shows mercy to the destitute, the suffering, the wounded, those who are ready to die. God calls upon every man to take up his neglected work, to seek to restore the moral image of the Creator in humanity. Letters 113-1901 How We May Love Our Neighbors As Ourselves We can love our neighbors as ourselves only as we love God supremely. The love of God will bear fruit in love to our neighbors. 
Many think that it is impossible to love our neighbor as ourselves, but it is the only genuine fruit of Christianity. Love to others is putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. It is working and walking with the invisible world in view. We are thus to keep looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Review and Herald, June 26, 1894.